Hello, this is uh, Dr. Acevedo. I'll be talking today about cancer as a metabolic problem. Now, this is a pretty interesting topic as most of you probably know that uh, cancer is a metabolic problem and not a genetic problem. We were taught in med school, this was 20 years ago, I was taught that cancer is a genetic problem. Now, I think it's still being taught in med school and medical students that I, that work with me, you know, before I joined here, that cancer is a genetic problem. Now, I think this is where the problem is, that we misunderstood cancer and its behavior. So, a lot of research has been done, we put a lot of money on it to find the right drug, finding the genetic problem, and targeting it with drugs. Um, so, what before I proceed, I'm going to ask you questions. One, what if cancer is not a genetic problem? Number two, would it make more sense to attack cancer as a metabolic problem? You know, blocking the common pathway that all cancer cell uses instead of sifting through a genetic problem where, in fact, in one nucleus, of a cancer cell, there are thousands of genetic defects. I believe this is the missing piece in cancer research. Cancer is a metabolic disease and not a genetic disease. And in fact, this book should be the textbook that should be taught in medical stu school, medical students. A book by Professor Thomas Seafred entitled Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. And in his research, he found out that um, the main problem in cancer is a mitochondrial problem. And this was even uh, discovered by Dr. Otto Warburg back in 1940s that if there's damage to the respiratory chain, which is found in the mitochondria, which is a powerhouse of our cell, okay, this is an organelle outside the nucleus, which is located in the cytoplasm that um, once it is damaged, it will revert to fermentation, which is um, how cancer cell gets its energy. So, I'm gonna prove to you today that cancer is not a genetic problem. I'm gonna show you a diagram, and this has been done by many researchers, even as far, as, as far back as 1980s. What they did was a nuclear transfer studies. So here in this diagram, as you can see here on this first slide or first uh, uh, picture here, that's a normal cell, okay? With a normal nucleus and a normal mitochondria. When it divides, it produces a normal cell. Now the second one here, this is a, a cancer cell, which has a, a normal nucleus which we now know that it has several genetic defects. It also has a, an abnormal mitochondria. When it divides, it produces tumor cells. Now here's what the researchers have done. They did nuclear transfer study where um, on this next picture here, a normal cell now has the abnormal nucleus from the cancer cell. And what happened was when the normal cell with the abnormal nucleus, with the cancer nucleus, when it divided, it, it produced, lo and behold, normal cell. Although it still has the genetic problems there, but it did not manifest as cancer. But on this last picture here, this is a cancer cell which has the normal nucleus with no genetic abnormalities. And when it divided, it produced two more cells. So now, this proves to us that cancer is not a genetic problem. So where is it coming from? But when you look at this, it has the abnormal mitochondria. So m definitely mitochondria is calling the shots here. At Baylor University, they did a mitochondrial transfer study Okay, to prove that it's really the mitochondria. 
And guess what happened? So the abnormal mitochondria from the cancer cell when it was transferred to a normal cell with a normal nucleus, guess what happened? It produced cancer cell. Whereas the normal mitochondria get transferred to a cancer cell with a normal nucleus, when it produced, it produced a normal uh, cell. So, folks, I think this is the main problem in cancer research. We've been, um, researchers have been doing a lot of research on finding the drug for uh, gene problems. But here's the problem. In one nucleus, there are thousands of genetic defects. So how in the world can we find the right drug and target those genetic defects, thousands of genetic defects? And in fact, some of you who are listening right now who had an RGCC test done, it's a 24-page report, and in those first few pages you see a lot of reds. Those are the genes that are overexpressed in your cancer cell or suppressed in your cancer cell. Overexpressed or mutated. Um, so there are several of those. And um, now that we know that it is a a mitochondrial problem what does it do so basically they find out that the cancer cells ferments okay and they find out that number one uh, substrate that cancer cell uses is glucose and pretty much all of us knows that um, glucose is the main driver of cancer cell and in professor Tom Seifert's research um, they also found that cancer cells ferments amino acids and the main amino acid that he found was glutamine so pretty much glucose and glutamine are being used by cancer cells as their main fuel to produce ADP now he also found out that in a normal cell most of our ATP are derived from the oxidative phosphorylation or the uh, electron transport chain so but in cancer cell most of the uh, energies or the ATPs are derived from the what they call substrate level phosphorylation which is the Krebs cycle and the glucose pathway so what caused damage to the mitochondria there are several things um, one of them is an infection a chronic infection that involves virus bacteria, fungus. Um, number two, in fact, one of the reasons why most of our cancer patients here, or pretty much all, we measure your viral panel to see if you have some uh, a viral infection that sometimes we don't know that you have a chronic lingering infection that might be the driver of your cancer. And I always tell my patients, you know, even though we tested you for these viruses, there are other viruses out there that we cannot measure, like retroviruses, XMRV, HDLV. These are retroviruses that we cannot uh, measure at this point. At least I'm not aware of any lab or blood test. So number two, carcinogens. We're exposed to chemicals every day, heavy metals. So one of those blood tests that we uh, measures heavy metal test and every cancer patient should have this number three we're exposed to EMF uh, electromagnetic frequencies and that damages the mitochondria number four um, hypoxia or low oxygen concentration um, that again damages the mitochondria that the cancer cell is uh, pretty much you know, gasping for air. So now they revert to glucose fermentation and glutamine fermentation. Um, chronic inflammation is another uh, thing that damages the mitochondria. And there are genetic defects like RAS, um, which is pretty rare. So that's why we say 95% of cancer is derived from environmental triggers and 5% are genetic. And because the RAS of uh, oncogene also damages the mitochondria. So now that we know that this is the problem in cancer, so it makes sense to attack cancer 
and attack the common pathway that the cancer cell uses. Okay. Um, so in our practice, we develop what what I call metabolic therapies, basically blocking the glucose pathway and blocking the glutamine pathway, which are the main fuel for cancer cells. So based on that, I always say to the patients, you know, attacking cancer is is a it's, a, it's an art of war, you know. Um, I wasn't in the military, but when you look at some war stories, which I used to watch when I was younger, even now, one of the strategic uh, attack or plan by the military is what? Guess what? Is blocking the, or cutting out the electrical supply or the power and the radar system, right? To blind the enemies or cutting off the power is a powerful thing so then after that they now you start to attack on those um, uh, remaining you know militaries or guard for example so in our practice here we block the main pathway glucose and glutamine pathways and then based on the RGC or C results there are genes that are overexpressed so let me mention a few of them. MMPs, or matrix metalloproteinase, those are the enzymes that cancer uses to invade the tissue, digest the tissue. So we've used some off-label drugs and some supplements that can block that. Another thing that is overexpressed in cancer cells are the growth factors. So epidermal growth factors, there is VEGF, VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor in the platelet-derived growth factors. Um, we actually have a, um, a drug out there called Avastin, which blocks the vascular endothelial growth factor. But see, that only blocks one growth factor, but how about the other two? So, but we have supplements that block those three growth factors. Then uh, another is COX-2, uh, which is an enzyme, an inflammatory enzyme, which uh, we can use off-label drugs like Celebrex or even, even aspirin. We can block that common pathway that cancer cell uses. So another thing that we use is, um, or another gene that is overexpressed is, have you heard, um, maybe some of you have heard is mTOR. And the R1. So if you if you're in front of your RGCC test right now, you can flick through that and you can see the MDR1, the mTOR. Usually, pretty much all cancer patients have overexpression of this uh, enzyme, and they're they're colored red, meaning high risk. So now knowing that uh, it is a metabolic problem, so how do we approach this? I, I mentioned a few of them. So in our practice, number one thing is nutrition, really important. So calorie restriction. Uh, based on research by Dr. Tom Seafred and Dr. Uh, Dominic Diagostino, uh, calorie restriction causes um, anti-angiogenesis, which is um, angiogenesis is when the cancer cell uses blood vessels uh, to form so they can get the nutrition. So calorie restriction is one of them to block that uh, angiogenic potential of cancer cells. Pro-apoptotic, meaning apoptosis is uh, programmed cell death, and uh, uh, but calorie restriction is, is you know, is pro-apoptotic, and it's also anti-inflammation. We know cancer is a chronic inflammation problem. So calorie restriction, we do that, and most of our patients uh, will see Liliana and Dr. Rooney who apparently has a class here every Wednesday, they'll teach you how to um, create a nutrition plan for you. And another thing that we can do is ketogenic diet, and that involves limiting the carbohydrate intake, moderate protein, and high uh, good fats. I know some of you are on plant-based diet, so again, that, that limits the carbohydrate and decreases the glucose. Um, we've came up with um, a, how much protein that people should should should, should eat. Uh, 
we computed that and it and it's between 40 and 50 grams per day because once you go beyond that then the cancer now uses the glutamine which is an amino acid so if your protein once it gets digested it turns into amino acids and glutamine is one of the it's one of them so we need to watch out for this so um so color restriction ketogenic diet intermittent fasting and now we have fast making diet uh, research by professor long of usc so when you can if you notice it's more about calorie restriction and what we've done here is that's the first step number two is we've developed iv protocols that would block the glucose pathway and we also have an IV protocol now that blocks the glutamine pathway along with nutrition um, and then the metabolic therapies and IVs, hyperbaric oxygen is another thing that we do and hyperthermia and those doctors that are doing this all over the world that are following the uh, what Professor Seafred and even Peter Peterson, uh, Dr. Peterson of Johns Hopkins um, have good results even with stage 4 cancer patients with less side effects um, and has a much better quality of life and I have papers to support what I'm saying here and I've seen papers from all over the world that doctors who, who do the metabolic therapy have a much better success even with stage 4 cancer patients so we, we are doing it here now in our facility at Cancer Center for Healing and Center for New Medicine. Um, another thing that I would like to mention is um, I don't know if you can see this, but this is pretty much a diagram of the cancer cell. So the glucose enters into the cytoplasm and goes in the in the, the Krebs cycle, which produces ATP for the cancer cells. And here down here is the glutamine pathway where Tom Seafred in his research showed that cancer cells also uses glutamine, goes into the Krebs cycle uh, under the substrate phosphorylation that produces ATP. So knowing what we know now, um, there is hope for our cancer patients, especially stage four. Um, so I mentioned some of the therapies that we do here. I call metabolic therapies and also we employ off-label medications. I'm talking about metformin, semethidine, dicyclamine, uh, I mean dipyridamol. So there's been tremendous research all over the world. Uh, one is in London, Yale University is using this uh, off-label drugs for cancer. So and they found out that it, it blocks certain pathways, especially the glucose, glutamine pathways, and some of the fatty acid pathway um, also. So, although this is kind of controversial, um, professor, um, one of the professors in London has been doing research on fatty acid metabolism, and he found out that cancer cell also uses fatty acids, but, uh, you know, Professor Seafred also mentioned that uh, it's probably not the main one because in the oxidative phosphorylation, a lot of these uh, enzymes are deficient in cancer cells. So, knowing what we know now, um, again, to me, approaching cancer is an art of war. So, we have to know first the, how our, our enemy behave what will be the supply or the root of, uh, of their nutrition or the root of where they could get uh, reinforcement. So I think uh, you have to be strategic in how to block all of this so cancer cell um, pretty much starves. So in summary, I would say Cancer is not a genetic problem, it's a mitochondrial problem. So protect your mitochondria as much as possible in any way you can now to prevent you from getting cancer. And I've, I've mentioned several of those causes. And, and number two, 
um, metabolic therapy, I believe, is the main approach in how we're going to treat cancer patients with less side effects. So sometimes we have to use low dose chemotherapy. And for those of you who are familiar with IPT, it's the same principle. We use insulin, glucose, and a low dose chemotherapy to drive the chemotherapy into the cancer cell. Again, you know, harnessing the glycolytic pathway, the glucose pathway that the cancer cell uses. In fact, uh, it's pretty interesting that the PET scan uses fluorodeoxyglucose, FDG, but Johns Hopkins, if I'm correct, they're coming up with a glutamine PET scan. So I think this was developed by uh, one of the radiologists under the direction of Dr. Peterson, if, uh, you know, uh, so they're coming up with glutamine PET scan now, uh, but it's not widely used yet. So this pretty astounding research and pretty interesting that, you know, it is the glucose and glutamine pathway that we need to block. So in the nutri nutrition part, we have Liliana, Dr. Rooney will help you as to what will be the best option for you to decrease the glucose, either calorie restriction, ketogenic diet, plant-based diet, whichever works for you, and a fast mimicking diet, um, along with the metabolic therapies that we have, blocking glucose and glutamine pathways, along with your nutrition, plus all the other therapies that we do, hyperbaric, hyperthermia, and insulin potentiation therapy if possible, and uh, endolacer, we can put all of this stuff uh, for, as part of your treatment plan to help you uh, with your um, cancer. So and I believe that cancer is a metabolic disease and this has been recreated by um, numerous publications all over the world by doctors who follow the research of Dr. Tom Seafred and Dr. Peterson of Johns Hopkins. So on behalf of Cancer Center for Healing and Dr. Keneally's team, um, we'll be honored to be part of your healing journey here. And again, we have interesting metabolic therapies, which gives hope to all our cancer patients. Thank you.